Um, so now I will introduce the speakers who will have about 20 minutes to speak. Um, so we're going to be speaking mm -hmm. about labor and economic consequences of COVID. Um, and again, our discussion will be after the speakers talk uh, using Stack. So our first speaker is Ellen David Friedman, uh, who is a founder of the Vermont Worker Center and a labor notes organizer. Ellen has worked in um, for the Vermont National Education Association and has been a leader in the community and or uh, community organizing and union unionizing. Um, Ellen has assisted Chinese workers, United um, Healthcare workers, barista workers, education workers, which also includes me personally. She's helped me out a lot. Uh, so a big welcome to Ellen. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. A delight to see you all. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, let me start by saying that the when this invitation was issued, it, it, the idea was to think about uh, COVID and COVID, what it what it meant, uh, what its impact was going to be uh, on the economy, how how labor and how working people were going to be affected by it. And of course, uh, we are now engulfed in another deep and profound and revealing and galvanizing crisis that has erupted this week. And so we have to uh, change the frame of reference uh, for tonight's conversation. I think you would probably all agree that to not do so would be a disservice. Um, and here's how I'm thinking about it. Um, I wanna talk about the sweep of um, resistance to neoliberalism, uh, particularly in the last 10 or 12 years since the last global financial crisis in 2008. And I wanna speak about these moments that we have experienced since then up to and including the moments that all of us have experienced today, yesterday, the day before. I'm sure many of you have been on the street and will continue to be on the street and witnessing in various ways this enormous eruption of outrage and indignation. So to look at the arc of this, to understand this as a response to the decay, the ending phase of uh, neoliberal hegemony uh, uh, with the US has been at the center of the global empire of world capital uh, for you know 50 or 75 or 100 years, whoever you wish to calculate it. And here's how I'd like to do it. I've been an organizer for about 50 years. I have worked in the labor movement that entire time. Uh, as Joe mentioned, I, did, I took a bit of a furlough and worked for 10 years in the labor movement in China. And I did this in the early twos, starting in about year 2003 or 2004, because I had become so profoundly dispirited about what was happening on the left and what was happening in the US labor movement that I couldn't stand it anymore. And since I wasn't going to give up on my commitment to the uh, liberation of the working class, since I couldn't give up on my commitment to socialism, which I have held uh, dearly since the early 1970s or late 1960s, my commitment to Marxism, I, I needed to clear my head because the environment for building a collective response uh, uh, to the the ills that neoliberalism had brought to our planet um, seemed utterly inadequate uh, to respond to the challenges. So uh, coming back from that, I found a changed, changed world in many ways because of the resistance that started to kindle in about 2010 with the Occupy movement. I wanna talk to each one of you in the call tonight as fellow organizers, you may or may not think of yourselves as that. I have no idea who most of you are. I don't know what kind of work you do. I don't know how you spend your time uh, or where you think of yourself in the great spectrum of organizing, but none of us can afford to not think of ourselves as organizers at this moment. This is needed so urgently. It is needed for the good of the world, but I believe it's also needed for our own souls. That when you see the, the uh, contradictions erupting as, as they have been this week, simply the, un, uh, of the uh, indispensable knowledge that has now come to everybody about the relationship of the state, uh, the use of its armed forces, the militarization of civil relationships, and the enforcement of terror in this, in this case, 
on uh, people of color, but every day in every case on immigrant workers, on low wage workers, on women, on every possible subset of uh, society, that the use of coercion, the use of domination, the use of state terror, the, the use of judicial terror, sometimes it just breaks on us in a way that means we cannot step back from responding. So I, I hope everybody here will think about my remarks uh, tonight and going forward from here um, as organizers. It's in that spirit that um, I thought I would sketch out a little bit of how it has looked to me and where I think we're at. As I mentioned when I talked about my despair in the early 2000s and why I had to leave and go to China, um, it was because uh, the labor movement, which is where I have lived for these last five decades, had become um, utterly bureaucratized. Um, I won't ask for a show of hands, but any of you who are in unions now, who have worked for unions, who are close to, who have studied unions, will know this to be the case, that they have become administrators of accords with employers that have entirely sacrificed the power of their members, the power of workers at the point of production, as Marx tells us, in exchange for some administrative understanding about how they will be employed, how they will be governed, basically how they will surrender their power at the workplace, and have traded it for this transactional relationship with democratic office holders and the democratic party as a whole. It's a pathetic bargain. It has disempowered and demobilized workers for many decades. The rest of the left, has also been ridiculously weak, desiccated, and misdirected. I won't spend much time on that um, because fortunately we are beginning to move out of that. But if some of you are interested, um, I consider an important thesis uh, on this subject uh, was put together by Arundhati Roy um, uh, and others have written about this on what I think of as the NGOization of the movement. Um, uh, a people's movement, a liberation movement, a movement of resistance is not an NGO. It does not spend its time raising money and funding itself and carrying out services to please its donors. A movement of people on behalf of the, the great numbers, the great majority of us who were misserved by capitalism has the character that we began to see again in 2010 with the Occupy movement. So uh, some of you will remember that the first Occupy that took place uh, was, not, was not in the US, but it was in Spain. I can't remember what year, 2009 maybe, but it, uh, Spain, the, uh, one of the early catastrophes of the shock doctrine, um, had uh, unemployment rates for people under the age of 30, if I remember correctly, there were over 30, 35% unemployment, uh, tremendous debt and lack of opportunity. Young people were living with their parents, could not get married, could not have kids, didn't bother finishing school because there was not gonna be any future that they could look forward to. And so a bunch of young people just picked up sleeping bags one day and walked into a public park and started sleeping there. And they were referred to as the indignados. They were simply indignant. This was not a political program. This was a cry of outrage. What kind of world have you given us? What is it you're asking us to do? What is expected of us in this kind of bleak environment? And I would say that the Occupy movement, where it erupted in most places, had that character. There were not coherent political programs. They were not planned activities. They were, they were eruptions of indignation, a howl of dismay. Now, at the time, you may or may not recall that there was a lot of kind of critique from liberal pundits and others saying, yes, but where's the program? And, you know, who's in charge? And who's making decisions? And where's the institutional framework? It was because these were non-bureaucratic responses. These were not NGO responses uh, to the problems people that were, face were facing. They were responses of last resort because people felt themselves to be utterly powerless in the face of um, the concentrated power that neoliberalism has created. Um, 
And so uh, they, of course, they, they petered out. Of course, they uh, went away. State got tired of them. They started cleaning out parks. People got exhausted. The weather turned. And after all, what is it you were claiming at a certain point, claiming the right to be in a park? But that by itself was not a political program that was going to galvanize people. Nevertheless, many people did get their chops there. And the kind of chops that people got, as I observed, the kind of experience people got that they couldn't unlearn was what direct participatory radical democracy looked and felt like. That is our best antidote to neoliberalism. It is our best antidote to a bureaucratic labor movement. It is our best antidote to the NGOization of the movement, in my view. Because uh, we only learn, again, I'm, I'm speaking as an organizer to all of you as organizers. I, I wonder whether you would agree with me, but I believe we actually only learn what the relations of power are by entering into collective struggle with those who have power. That's how we learn. We prepare ourselves, we read, we study, we look at history, we make plans, but it's actually when you commit yourself to that kind of struggle. Anyway, Occupy died down, but simultaneous to that, we saw this other thing arising, which was um, the, some of you again may remember Scott Walker, who was then the governor of Wisconsin, who passed these draconian labor laws to eliminate collective bargaining for public sector employees, and particularly he was aiming at teachers and the teachers union. Um, and there was again, a, just a, a spontaneous unplanned upsurge of, of, of anger, of indignation in this that resulted in the occupation of the state capital in Wisconsin, went on for 10 or 12 days, I don't remember exactly. Um, and it was defeated. Uh, they did not get their demands. And in fact, uh, the, the public sector unions in Wisconsin suffered tremendous setback from which they, they have been recovering fortunately. But again, this was an experience for many, many people. It was the first time where they came face to face with the nakedness of what actual existing power relationships are in this country. And I can tell you as a union organizer, I hear sometimes dozens of times a day from workers in many different sectors who are coming to terms for the first time with the fact that their employers don't care about them. I was did a two-hour session with teachers today in uh, New Bedford, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, they're vocational teachers. They just formed a union. They, they had their first bargaining session, and some of them were in tears because they said, well, the superintendent didn't even have enough respect to come meet with us in the bargaining session. And then all of the proposals that we made were simply brushed aside and ignored. They don't care. This is horrible. They don't care. Well, friends, as organizers, it's not a minute too soon to help everybody around us understand that the relationships of struggle, whether it's class struggle that's embodied in the labor movement, whether it's civil insurgency, such as the movement of all of us against police brutality, has nothing to do with human compassion. It has nothing to do with people's personalities and whether or not they are smart or sensible or caring people. We are caught in structural relationships created for us by the conditions of capitalism that require us to respond in structural ways. And what I mean by that is we must recognize that our only power to change anything in society has to do with our willingness to behave collectively. And in my view, collectively means through radical democratic participatory forms of decision making not by having one great, one great man of history. Um, I, I worked with Bernie Sanders for 50 years. I lived in Vermont until a couple of years ago. I now live in Ithaca. I've worked with Bernie for decades. I think his contribution to the movement has been extraordinary and absolutely priceless. Um, but he, everything that he has done, and even if he was elected president, I would not trade for the kind of work that is being done now on the streets and in some of our unions to bring people together at the base to learn how to govern themselves and to make demands on 
what we consider to be illegitimate abuses of authority. So I want to now fast forward from um, uh, uh, the uprising in Wisconsin uh, to in a few years after that, we saw an unbelievable thing happen in Chicago. The Chicago Teachers Union went on strike in 2013 for the first time in 30 years. Now this happened, as some of you may or may not know, because a small group of teachers who were socialists got together in a reading group and they said, what are we gonna do about our union leadership? Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago, is closing down schools in brown and black communities in Chicago. He's flipping them, turning them over to real estate developers and uh, setting up, uh, letting public money flow into private and for-profit charter schools while black and brown kids, immigrant children, white working class kids are being warehoused in ever more deprived public schools and our union is not doing anything about this. This is unacceptable. To respond, now this is important, they didn't go out on the street. They didn't, they didn't do what Occupy did. They didn't do what happened in Wisconsin. They said, we're gonna take over our union. And it took them five or six years to do that. They had to form a caucus. Some people may know a caucus is a small politicized group within a, in a union that tries to move the union and its program to the left, sometimes by running for office and sometimes by using other methods. They took a number of years, they developed, they built a base, they built a base, they fought on issues, they proved themselves credible. They were elected to leadership of the Chicago Teachers Union in 2012 and in 2013, brought the entire city to its knees in a massive strike involving 30, about 30,000 teachers in which for the first time, public support, support from parents and the general public was strongly in support of those teachers. And I say for the first time, because I lived through the last round of teacher strikes in the 1960s and 70s, which were wildly unpopular in the communities and with parents. So something has shifted. What shifted was this union decided to take its proper role as unions should, as a fighter, as a leader in social justice struggles. Their strikes were not about wages and benefits, or this strike in Chicago was not. It was about the return to apartheid in the Chicago school system. It was about the deprivation of the school system, the deprivation and the uh, damage it was inflicting on the lives of primarily the black, brown and black students. Now this started <clears throat> what we call a wave of um, blue state and blue city organizing among teachers. And I won't have enough time to go into this in detail, except those of you that are interested, there's plenty to read about it. What has happened is that inspired by the, the caucus and the Chicago Teachers Union, all over the country, groups of teachers on the left, mostly socialists, many, many DSA members decided to form caucuses in their unions, have done that to take over their unions. So there is now caucus leadership running UTLA, the United Teachers of Los Angeles, who brought their members out on an absolutely galvanizing strike in a year ago in January, 37,000 teachers, again, with very, very broad popular support. And again, that was, they called that a racial justice strike. Uh, leadership, uh, progressive leadership is now uh, in charge of uh, the unions in uh, St. Paul and Seattle and Detroit, the entire state of Massachusetts, the state of North Carolina. As we speak, votes are being cast um, to elect hopefully a slate of progressive leaders to the West Virginia Teachers Union. So a, a wave was started that has it, it has an awareness of the need for strategy. It has an awareness of the need to do something other than just be indignant, go out on the street and yell. That's incredibly important. But some portions of our movement, and I think the strongest parts of our movement must be centered in, among workers and must be centered in the workplace because that's actually where we get to bring them to their knees. Um, anyway, that's my own view. That's why I've given 50 years of my life to this movement. Let me just quickly add one more last chapter that brings us to right now, 
which is after the Chicago teachers strike, Los Angeles teachers strike, some of you are also aware there was a wave of what we refer to as the red state strikes. And those were strikes that happened in 2018, 2019 in states with draconian, horrible punitive labor laws and about half a million teachers went out on illegal strikes in 2018 and 19, illegal strikes. Um, now, once again, what we're showing is a form of power, people recognizing power. And by the way, they won hundreds of millions of dollars in those strikes uh, to counter the austerity attacks on public schools. Now, I mention this as background to the moment, the two moments that we're in now, addressing the crisis of the pandemic and addressing the crisis of uh, police genocide against uh, Black Americans, to say this, we have crises that are chronic and that are deeply rooted, that are inseparable from the existence of capitalism in this country. We have always had, human beings have viruses. We are subject to viruses. Some of them are very bad and we can't get them easily controlled and others we bring under control relatively easily. We know that this crisis has been infinitely exacerbated by the uh, inequalities that have been fostered uh, by this stage of capitalism. We know that the economic crisis, which is already upon us and is only going to deepen exponentially, is itself a predictable crisis of capitalism. It goes through these cycles where it destroys itself and the center of capitalist power passes from one part of the world to another. Many of us believe, I believe it is passing to China and that's what we're seeing now. The summation of this is that we've been through a period in the last 10 years where indignation, anger, incredulity is beginning to give way to a sense, and, and I think DSA's growth and DSA's work is part of this, to a sense that we had better start getting very serious about our strategies, about our long-term strategies. Choose our targets. I recommend the workplace. I recommend it over electoral politics. I recommend it over many other forms because the only thing that they, they, can, they can coerce us, manipulate us, undermine us as citizens, as consumers, as community activists, there is one thing we do that we control in the end and that's the ability to give or withhold our labor power. And when we withhold our labor power, we withhold their ability to generate capital, profit, and therefore power. So I encourage all of us to think very seriously. It doesn't have to be labor. I encourage you to think about a labor strategy, but to really think about the building of long-term strategic thinking and strategic planning. We're at a very vulnerable moment. We've been squandering our power for most of the last 40 years. We can't afford to do it anymore. So go out and go out and take it. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Alan. Um, our next speaker uh, is Hadas Thier. Um, uh, she's a regular uh, contributor to Jacobin, an activist and socialist in uh, New York, DSA member and author of the forthcoming book, A People's Guide to Capitalism, an Introduction to Marxist uh, Economics, which will be out soon. Um, so welcome, Hadas. Hi, thank you. Um, Thanks for inviting me to, to speak with you all. Um, I wanna start with um, something I don't usually like to start with when I, when I do a talk, which is to apologize because I, um, like I imagine everyone else is right now in, in, in a totally exhausting and overwhelming week. And um, so I, I am sorry if my thoughts are disjointed and um, hopefully this is a forgiving crowd. I, um, so, um, and, and the other thing that I sort of struggled with when I was putting together my thoughts for this is just, it feels in some ways strange to be talking about the economy at this moment when the entire country is, you know, exploded in, in rage over police violence, as um, Ellen talked about, like trying to reframe um, this discussion and what, what we're talking about, um, you know, mass protests, the violent repression, the curfews. Um, there's a lot that we have to contend with right now and think through, um, but in some ways it's also, just the right time to be talking about the economy as well, um, because we're currently 
at a convergence of the of profound and simultaneous crises of the economy of a racist social order um, and of a global pandemic um, and it's not a coincidence that all of these things are converging um, at the same time um, but really it's, it's 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 part of one one crisis which is being fueled by these multiple uh, but completely connected issues um, you know so we have the violence and the brutality of racism of the state um, as like a, a driving catalyst um, for an uprising that's now swept across all 50 states um, you know we were talking a little bit before this call started it's really just um, I don't know un unprecedented and kind of shocking that it's happening in the midst of a pandemic, um, you know, it's all 50 states, it's small towns, it's conservative towns, it's, um, um, it's really, um, um, yeah, uh, in, in incredible, um, there's no other way to, to, to put it. Um, and, um, and let's see, where are my notes here? Um, uh, so all of that is taking place you know, basically at the foot of an economic depression um, and a mangled state response to a pandemic that now is not only killing us in the hundreds of thousands, but it's doing it in a very uneven way along um, the lines of race and class. Um, there's this, this video that I just saw today or yesterday um, on New York One of a reporter who's speaking with this black mother and social worker um, at one of the protests in New York. And the reporter asks her, well, you know, what do you say about people who are saying um, the riots and the looting are overshadowing the message of the protests. And she says, you know, the government gave people $1,200 um, to survive on. What did you think was going to happen? We need jobs. We need to feed our babies. Um, none of this would be happening if that wasn't the case. This is what sick and tired looks like. Um, and she goes on to say a lot of actually really smart things. Um, I, maybe I can, I can um, put the link on the chat because it's worth seeing the whole clip. Um, but I think you know it 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 speaks very powerfully to this intersection um, of uh, economic, racial, social, um, and health um, crises that we're we're in the midst of. Um, David Harvey actually just wrote um, well. He wrote this right before the um, things things blew up, and in, in, um, but he was writing about the economy, and he wrote. The disparities that underpin the urban uprisings of the 1960s are still with us. In fact, they are deeper than ever. A few more months of lockdown and capitalist collapse and the uprising will almost, the uprisings will, will almost certainly begin. Um, and he wrote that about like um, a week or two ago. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I live in, in Brooklyn, which is currently under curfew. Um, and the connection here between the pandemic, racism, capitalism um, is just clear by the day. Um, you know, New York City is one of the main epicenters of the pandemic. Black and Latino death rates are twice as high as the death rate for um, their white counterparts, um, which there's a lot of reasons for, but all of the reasons have to do with institutional racism and its effect on health, chronic diseases like high blood pressure and heart disease, and the availability of hospitals and health insurance, um, and the delivery of proper care um, to, to people of color. Um, and, you know, Obviously, two people of color are overwhelmingly represented in jobs that are deemed essential, um, which I've increasingly realized essential is like an Orwellian double speak for dispensable. Um, and um, so, you know, people with jobs, in groceries, delivery people, nurse aides, nurses, um, where they have to go to work, they have to ride the subway to get there. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, yeah. Um, and you combine that with the reality that the protester that I just quoted said about the $1,200 checks that are supposed to cover our, you know, that have already obviously run out. Um, and this long, deep-seated history of police violence that enforces, you know, essentially a second-class citizenship of an entire race by killing Black people with impunity. Um, and so, you know, right now we're seeing, like, the role of the, of the police, which just couldn't be clear. You know, there's, like, um, there's a weird, you know, stream of videos on social media that are trying to convince us that there's like good cops and bad cops. Um, and of course, there's variations um, among the police force, but the overwhelming impact of sending out thousands of cops in riot gear to violently disperse protests and of curfews 
um, is to protect property, it's to protect store, stores, it's to disorient and disempower um, protesters. Um, and and in, in New York, um, you know, in New York City here, we have this, the mayor and the governor, which have been squabbling on and off for, I don't know, the last how, however long, but, but both of them, you know, took way too long to shut down the city um, and, and have already, despite the fact that like Cuomo is supposed to be like the good guy as opposed to Trump, um, but they've already started opening things up. Um, and the number of deaths in, in New York would have been significantly smaller if they had acted with more resolve. But instead, um, we have already one out of 400 New York City residents has died of COVID. Um, that's incredible. Um, now you contrast that with the very quick actions that they've taken to lock the city down and protect property and you get a picture of how capitalism works mm -hmm. um, and the specific role of cops within that. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's important to talk about the economy at this moment because um, it serves as sort of the underlying connector of all these issues. Um, and, but the other key piece is that understanding those interconnections also help us knit together a broader left program where we can connect a demand to defund the police with demand for a Green New Deal and Med Medicare for all, you know, that's part of a, a vision of the kind of society we want, um, you know, the kind of social and economic priorities that we want for the society. Um, so I'm going to try to like race through a couple of like basic definitions about capitalism and then talk a little bit about where that leaves us right now in terms of the current um, economy. Um, so, you know, the basic definition of capitalism, right, it's a system of commodity production for sale on the market, but it's fundamentally, and I think this is the most important part, it's, it's a social relationship of exploitation. Um, you know, whereas mainstream economists talk about economics in terms of like numbers and prices and profits, um, a Marxist understanding of economics is fundamentally about human beings, our relationships to each other and the planet. Um, and at its best, when the capitalist economy is like healthy, um, it's just, it's built on exploitation, poverty, oppression, and environmental destruction. Um, so um, the basis of that exploitation under capitalism um, is, is based on what, you know, Marx called our labor power, our ability to labor, um, being a commodity under capitalism, which is sold, bought and sold uh, for a wage on the labor market. Um, and what determines the, the value of that labor power um, is the price of, you know, how much it costs to continue to sustain our ability to go back and work the next day. So like, you know, the um, shelter, education, food, clothes, et cetera. Um, and, um, you know, anyway, I, there's more to be said about that, but um, I'm just going to kind of skim the surface a little bit here so that I have time to say a few things about the current um, crisis that we're in. Um, so the, the difference between, there's one main difference though about labor power as a commodity under capitalism and like every other commodity under capitalism, which is that we're human beings. Um, and so there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the theoretical value of labor power, um, you know, and then the cost of our actual labor power as in our wages and benefits. Um, because unlike other commodities, um, labor power is socially conditioned, both in the positive sense, um, in terms of what Ellen was talking about, how we organize and fight for better wages um, through unions and other means. Um, you know, unlike other commodities, we can, we can fight um, and organize. Um, and, and it's also uh, conditioned in the negative by oppression, you know, all the ways that um, oppression kind of drives down wages by disempowering us, making us desperate to take um, any job at any um, at any price, um, whether that's because of um, the threat of deportations for immigrants, police violence and mass incarceration, the use of debt, um, et cetera. These are all levers of oppression that, um, you know, help to drive wages down below, um, below the value of actually like sustaining our ability to, to, to labor. Um, so, and then the other thing is that um, it's different between labor power and other commodities under capitalism is that labor power has a unique ability to create more power than more value than we're worth. Um, so the capitalist pays us for, um, you know, the value that's gone into the production of our means to sustain ourselves, um, our wage. 
but then the fruits of our labor is a totally different figure. Um, so let's say you work at Starbucks and in the first two hours you make like 120 bucks, which is your daily wage, let's say. Um, so you can't then go home after two hours and say, look, that's fair. I produced the amount of money that you're paying for me. Um, you owe them that other six hours, um, no matter um, you know, how much you produce um, in that six hours. And that's basically free labor for, you know, that's how they, they pocket all that money. So um, th that's kind of like a, a, um, a simple bare bones explanation of how capitalism works. Um, and, but at its most healthy state, um, it's built into that as all sorts of contradictions that can only be resolved through crises. And that's why we go through these, um, as Ellen mentioned, like boom bust cycles, um, cap where capitalism basically has to destroy capital in order to move forward, um, where people's lives are completely upended. Um, and, you know, I, there's, there isn't like one singular Marxist theory of crisis. Marx didn't like lay out his theory of crisis in one place for you to just like read through and be like, okay, that's what Marx said about crisis. He wrote about it in a lot of different places. And there's a lot of um, debate among Marxists um, and, and radical economists about which of the things that he said are like the critical things and what to emphasize, et cetera. And I'm not gonna get into those debates here, obviously, but um, if you're interested, um, you could also, I could send out a link for it, but, um, there's a, there's a talk on wearemany.org about, um, that I gave about um, the debates within, debates about Marxist theory of crisis. Um, but I think the, the important thing is that there, there are these contradictions and they, and they, they explode in various ways at different times. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, capital accumulation is driven not by needs, but by profits. Um, you know, in Marxist jargon, it's, the creation of um, not of use values of what people actually need, but of exchange values of how things sell on the market. Um, and, you know, the, so for instance, like a bread piece of bread, like the use value is what matters to most of us because I need to eat it. Um, so it matters what it, what it does. Um, but for a capitalist, you know, they don't care whether they're producing bread or nuclear arms or, you know, widgets or whatever. They care about how much they, the bread or with the widgets or whatever sell for. Um, and, um, and that's what drives all of um, the, um, that's what drives all of the decision making under capitalism. Um, and that creates a lot of um, challenges and contradictions. Like if you think about like, how is the, the housing market, how is construction to be organized, right? If the housing market was just about housing people, then, you know, it would be a pretty straightforward calculation. You know, how many people need houses? Uh, how do we marshal the right amount of materials and people to build those houses, um, et cetera. But if you have a housing market that's based on making money, flipping houses, renting money, at, renting you know, housing at exorbitant costs and so on, then, the, then you have to figure out what's effective demand that is, you know, who has the money to purchase these things, how much are they willing to pay, how much debt can they take on to do that. There's a lot of moving parts and it's done completely in an unplanned way. Like there's not like the housing industry, like all get together and be like, okay, so we think we need, you know, let's divvy, we think we need a thousand of, in New York City, let's divvy it up, you do a hundred, I'll do a hundred. Um, and so, um, yeah, anyway, so you have this, this um, uh, uh, drive to, pr to get profits that's completely unplanned. Um, and you have this, this growth and constant accumulation that's like inherent in capitalism um, that is not driven by demand, but is um, the other way around. Like su it's actually supply that drives demand. Um, so if you think about like the auto industry, which took off in the 1920s, with the uh, um, assembly line, Ford's assembly line. They, they went down from like 12 hours on average to produce a car to one and a half hours to produce a car. That happened in the 1920s through the assembly line. Um, and that produced a mass market for cars. It wasn't that like all of a sudden, like there was a clamoring for cars and therefore the capitalists had to figure out how to produce them faster. It was each company has to figure out how to, how to compete with you know, it's other, you know, with other competing, um, um, uh, with other, with other uh, companies to make things faster and cheaper 
um, and to flood the market um, with their, to take a greater part of the market, to expand the market and then to take a greater part of it. Um, and so it, it drives this, in, this constant um, accumulation because you, you reduce the prices of the commodities that you're producing in order to make more of them, right? Like Ford didn't like say, oh, well, now we can do this more quickly and cheaply. So I'll produce the same amount of cars, but just sell them for less money. Um, Cause that wouldn't make any, any sense. Um, they would just lose money. So instead they, they produce things cheaply on a mass basis in order to flood the market um, and um, have produced more. But everybody is doing this, right? Um, so there's a constant need to like expand, to grow market share, to grow the market. And you know the the process of exploitation where um, workers are producing more than we're getting paid means that there's more wealth with which to accumulate and to grow that market. Um, okay, so all this to say, um, one of the main results results of all this is a boom and bust cycle, um, which Marxists often call crises of overproduction, uh, because accumulation runs so ahead and so fast and um, is not actually driven by demand, it's driven by this um, compulsion to produce more and more profit. Um, we have these like, it produces great um, bubbles, great expansions that run ahead of demand, um, et cetera. Um, and you know, in, in, in many ways, the great recession um, of a decade ago, it really was a crisis of overproduction. There was a there was the deregulation of finance, which there has been a lot of discussion of, but that really only exacerbated a problem, an underlying problem of a global overproduction of goods um, that was um, itself like a decade long in the making and was powered by this debt fueled um, consumption. So massive growth of debt at that time, massive um, um, a, a overproduction of goods. Um, and that all came to, he to head. It, 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 it showed itself first in the housing market, but it um, uh, resonated, you know, much more widely in in, um, in the economy. Um, and then in that crisis, instead of letting you know bankruptcies and the crisis of of the economy kind of restructure it on a more profitable basis, the state, as we know, like stepped in with trillions of dollars worth of bailouts um, to Wall Street. Um, and the result was like basically dragging along unprofitable industries, but a booming stock market. Um, and, you know, basically the, the recovery since has been one of um, lagging in investment, la you know, very slow growth rates, um, a global economy that's still oversaturated. Um, and you know you had these bailouts and huge tax write-offs under Trump too for corporations and the rich, which resulted in um, more state debt and deficits as well. So like the the, the bailouts, the tax cuts, um, have resulted in these um, you know a lot of state debt, um, which then we are made to pay for um, through austerity, budget cut, you know cutbacks, um, the likes of which incidentally have left our hospitals completely underfunded and ill-equipped um, to handle a pandemic. Um, and that, you know, brings us to today. Um, and so I want to just touch on a couple of things. First um, is to say before the pandemic even hit, the U.S. economy was headed towards a recession, um, in part um, the regular boom and bust cycle that's built into the system that, that we talked about, but also the context of um, <clears throat> Um, of these contradictions of the Great Recession that were the very low grow growth rates, um, the massive austerity and inequality. Um, and so on top of this already weakened economy, um, which was headed towards a recession before the pandemic, we've been hit with like a complete and unprecedented shock to the system. Um, and, you know, were it the case that the economy was on a healthy foundation to begin with, um, and the state handled the pandemic with some amount of competence, which seems, um, you know, hard to imagine exactly. Um, it would still be very difficult to rebound um, in any way um, that resembled the sort of like V-shaped recovery that the, the talking heads often talk about. Um, but given where things are at, um, the one thing we can say with total certainty is that there won't be any sort of a V-shape. Um, and um, you know, there's there's all of the the underlying weaknesses, so slow growth, unprecedented dependence on consumer and corporate debt to fuel consumption, 
the unprecedented dependence on low interest rates and injections from the Fed to fuel investment. Um, that's our, um, our underlying um, conditions. But on, on top of that now, we have the severity of these shocks, which really, um, I feel like I've used the word unprecedented like all the time now when I talk about anything to do with the economy because it's really hard to, to wrap your head around. Um, but, you know, industry, services, transportation network that connects them all are all, you know, largely at a standstill. Um, the energy industry, which is the common denominator across the economy, um, is facing a completely cratered demand um, and, um, you know, has basically gone into a complete free fall. Um, as businesses go out of business, they can't just, even in a best case scenario, reopen once the pandemic is over. Um, they've lost an a, a credible amount of revenue. They've shut down entire stores or plants or operations, and they can't just spring these back online, uh, both for logistical reasons and reasons of, of cash flow. Um, so both profitability and employment aren't going to rebound anytime soon. Um, we also have these un unemployment numbers. I mean, 40 million people um, unemployed. It's, uh, um, it's stunning. Um, and 40% and, and of the people that are unemployed had been earning 40 less than forty thousand dollars a year um which means you know these are like depression era numbers but they also point to like what happens when you have a completely non-existent social safety net and a heavily indebted population um you know we have there there's no there's no we have no safety net upon which to like keep the economy going on life support um and you know what are millions of people going to do with no savings no safety net and a one-time check for 1200 bucks um that's going to lead to explosive conditions, obviously, um, as we're as we're already seeing. Um, and uh, on top of that, there's no um, there's no health solutions, right? I mean, this is um, the the problem of the pandemic is a problem of, of health and of life and death issues, uh, and it's also a problem of rebooting the economy because it's, the economy is not going to flow until the pandemic is under control. But we have no, you know, national. Uh, strategy for, for doing so. Hospitals um, are literally in bidding wars for masks and ventilators. Um, there's no coordinated campaign of um, um, education, testing, uh, tracing. Um, and, and, and fundamentally, you know, capitalism, because it's, um, it's built on just a constant growth model and constantly needing to move forward, it can't actually handle doing what's needed and necessary. To, um, to stop the pandemic, to sh actually shut down the economy for long enough um, to, to stop the disease um, because the economy has to keep growing um, or, um, or it's gonna grow into, or it goes into cardiac arrest. Um, so just um, a couple of last points here in, in, the, in the two minutes I have remaining. Um, you know, the US government has marshaled again, a completely unprecedented, um, amount of money to keep credit flowing um, through the, the Fed um, to the financial sector and to, and, and to big businesses. Uh, but they've done very little um, by way of a fiscal stimulus um, to, to help, um, to help uh, regular people, um, to help hospitals, um, to help state budgets. Um, you know, all of these things are already on the chopping block. Um, in New York, they're already um, talking about cutting uh, hospital budgets um, and education budgets and um, all of the things that we, we more desperately need than ever. Um, and that is really going to set the framework for the coming years, right? Um, of We have a capitalist, the capitalist class pushing for corporate and Wall Street bailouts and austerity to pay for it. Um, and then we have labor and social movements, um, which will need to push and already are pushing um, for, you know, um, safe work conditions, but also for stimu for real stimulus uh, spending, for remaking the economy along different lines. Um, and we're, um, we're likely headed um, towards a very deep and protracted depression um, that are, is going to provide the underlying context for the, the labor struggles, the social struggles um, ahead. And it's, it's um, a desperate situation. But it's also, um, but it's also an, a hopeful situation in the sense that capitalism is exposed, um, has been exposed, and on every possible level, and not in the thousands, but to like the millions, um, are seeing what what's happening, 
um, and the, the breadth of the uh, protests that have taken place so far um, really speaks to that. And so at this moment, I think we can actually really broaden our political horizons. We have, you know, the future um, direction of the economy and our society is going to be determined by the struggles um, in the coming years. And we can put forward, I think, within that a much broader vision of what's possible and what's necessary. Awesome. Thank you so much, Das.